everyone. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Brecht Salen. I am a policy analyst at the European University Association, and I'm also work package leader in the FAIRS FAIR project. And on behalf of my fellow presenters and, and project members and, and uh, our entire project, I'm welcoming you to this workshop today. I'm going to start sharing my screen, uh, which I hope you can all see. Yes, that works fine. Perfect. Uh, for a quick welcome uh, to what this workshop is, what the context of this workshop is. And I'm not going to take too long because I'm really looking forward to our presenters today. And they have also the practical information we want to share with you today. And also afterwards and set up uh, a discussion with all of you in breakout rooms. But just as a context to this workshop, learning lessons from FAIR data implementations, implementation, uh, this is a workshop that is coming out of the FAIRS FAIR project. Uh, the FAIRS FAIR project uh, is a project about fostering FAIR data practices in Europe. And I mean, you can see here in this slide sort of summarizing an entire three-year project is that essentially we started in March 2019. And what that means is that all the outcomes you can see to the right of the screen, uh, too much to go into right now. We are now nearing that uh, final phase of the project uh, where we are starting to deliver many of these things. Many of these things have already been delivered. And that allows us today, I think, to present and have a discussion on uh, what are going to be the near to final uh, outcomes and results of our project. The objectives of the work package that I'm leading, there's a couple of other work packages involved in today's workshop as well, who have very similar uh, work lines and information to share, but the objectives of work package seven uh, are essentially these. I'm going to put them on screen and I want to point your attention to uh, the last objective on screen here, which is our work package has been working to support embedding FAIR data education in university programs and doctoral training. So bachelor, master uh, and doctoral training, those levels uh, we have started to look, have been looking in our work package and how can we embed FAIR data education throughout uh, the career of students and then ultimately doctoral candidates in an effective way to provide them with those skills. Uh, that meant that we have gone through an entire process in our work package. You can see that on this slide. Uh, we started with essentially getting a good overview of the entire landscape via a survey. There has been desk research, a briefing was published, and a competence framework was also developed. But what you can see in terms of what we've done in our work package so far is that to the right of the screen uh, there is still two things that we need to deliver and those will be the practical tools that build on all the work that has been done so far which is an adoption handbook and a good practices support the adoption handbook uh, we will not uh, go into too much detail today but the good practices report is something we will be presenting preliminary findings of today uh, these two are intended to be very practical tools for universities to either get an overview of how they could implement curricula, what a good curricula, curriculum could look like in this field. And the good practices is then sort of inspiration from other universities uh, taking these initiatives and what they have learned. Uh, that is something we'll be talking about today. Quick slides. Um, we do have a uh, workshop upcoming next month on the adoption handbook. Uh, we're organizing this together with the University of Göttingen. Uh, registrations are open for that. A program is available on the FAIRS FAIR website. And that is a workshop, uh, again, where we all invite you to join. And we'll really be talking about the uh, adoption handbook of Work Package 7. But today, uh, today, as you can see in the program, we're going to be focusing on a few other things. First off, uh, I'm very happy to introduce my colleague, Federica Garbulia, who is assisting me in Work Package 7. She will be, uh, for the very first time, publicly uh, presenting uh, some of the preliminary findings of the Good Practices Report. We've been doing some interviews, and 
we are now happy to sort of show uh, our first analysis, a couple of the common threads that we keep picking up uh, through the interviews within, with universities uh, taking initiatives in fair data education. Uh, we're also very happy to be joined by Elizabeth Newbold uh, and Joy Davidson from different work packages in our project, who themselves, as you can see from the titles of their presentations, have been doing very relevant work uh, for the discussion we want to have today. And I will let them introduce all of that work later. After those three presentations to start, uh, we will have a quick Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll have time to pick up on a couple of your questions. And with that all done, uh, we can have a breakout uh, room session where we want to hear from you. So essentially now, these presentations uh, are basically a lot of the work that we've been developing, and we hope then to conclude with uh, breakout discussions on how you reflect on that work, what your own experience has been. And we will all come back to uh, the plenary session here to wrap all that up, highlight a couple of issues that came out of the discussion with you. Uh, but that's for later. Right now, I'm happy to introduce uh, my colleague Frederica Garbulia for uh, the first preliminary findings of the Good Practices Report that will be published uh, later this year. Rika, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Jack, for the introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. I will be sharing my screen, too. OK, I hope you can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so good afternoon, everybody. As Brecht uh, said, uh, today we'll be, we will be sharing with you the, for the very first time the results, the first results from the Good Practices in Fair Competence Education, which is the uh, one of the final big deliverables, as we saw, of the World Bank <laughs> 7 of the First Fair Project. Um, before diving deep into the, into, into the findings, I just wanted to to explain why we are doing this work and why we are publishing this, um, this uh, report. So uh, through the work we have been doing uh, uh, in this year, both within the first fair and but also within EUA, we saw that there is currently a, a substantial gap between the strategic importance that universities attribute to RDM and fair data and their practical implementation. As you can see uh, from the slide, uh, from the data we gather uh, on the EUA Open Science Survey from this year. This gap is uh, due to a uh, um, lack of awareness, uh, but also of skills and of training activities at all level which uh, is something that universities also mentioned in a, uh, in a survey that we did within First Fair and we published last year, where university really uh, stated that they need the practical guidance on how they can apply fair data, fair data practices, but also all the skills and competencies that come with, uh, uh, with practicing fair. So uh, this, we really hope for this report to be addressing this, uh, this background and especially that the report will be on, on the one side, a practical tool for universities that they can use to start embedding fair data and uh, fair data skills in uh, their education, in their university programs, but also in their doctoral training. And on the other end, also, we would like to provide inspiration for universities who uh, would like to start a similar training programs uh, on and showing how other universities have been addressing, for example, implementation challenges, talking with the leadership uh, and ensuring the sustainability. Uh, to, to this aim, we will present in the report different good practices coming from universities that have been, uh, were able to, um, to develop and implement uh, training programs, uh, teaching courses aimed at teaching fair data and RDM skills at the bachelor, master and doctoral level. Just a few words about the methodology that we have been uh, using for, for our report. Uh, you can see here at the bottom of the slide, the uh, five uh, good practices that we have been analyzing until now. This is also why these are the first findings because we are also working in uh, to getting new good practices and uh, um, analyzing more of them. Uh, as a general remark, these uh, are all institutional practices and the training activities focused on, as I mentioned, teaching RDM and fair data. 
And uh, these are mainly targeting doctoral researchers, but we are, um, we are working to get more examples coming from the bachelor and master levels. And these come from four different European countries. And another aim we have for the work we have uh, uh, in front uh, in this next month, we would like to get uh, more examples also from outside Europe. Uh, we organized follow-up interviews with these good practices because they were first invited to present at different Warpack 7 events. And the interviews we did with them were focused on four different uh, um, macro areas that you can see here on this slide and that I will uh, talk uh, a little bit more about them now that I present the findings. The first area was scope and objectives. Uh, in this case, we asked the participants of the interviews to tell us more about uh, what were the drivers that guided their decision to implement uh, these training activities for RDM and FAIR data, uh, but also if there, this was related to any national or European um, uh, initiative. What we saw is that uh, for university, it's really important to be aware of two elements. The first one is um, really uh, based at the institutional level. So to be aware of the context that the institutional practice needs to be implemented, having in mind the, the operational, legal and cultural context uh, is in fact needed to ensure that the right strategy is uh, created uh, around, the, around the, the initiative. And then in the long term, it will also uh, ensure the sustainability of the, of the practice. But also it's very important to be aware of opportunities at the national and European level. We saw in uh, practically almost all the good practices we talked to that they came from um, also from, uh, uh, from a new impetus coming from the national level and the European level to uh, promote open science. And these initiatives um, from the uh, top down can ensure not only to give a framework, uh, a, a more general framework to the initiative that happened at the institutional level, but they also can um, provide universities with the capacity uh, resources in terms of staff, but also with the financial resources. A uh, point we would like to make here is that the national rectors conferences can be indeed key actors uh, in uh, providing this type of uh, national frameworks. And especially because we talked with one uh, national rectors conference, Swiss universities from, from Switzerland, and they implemented a national funding scheme to uh, encourage universities to work together and implement uh, fair data and RDM skills in their, in their programs. The second pillar is the capacity, and here instead we uh, wanted to gain uh, information on uh, uh, capacity both in terms of uh, staff, but also in terms of financial capacity. What we saw from uh, talking with, uh, with the universities and uh, with the other institutions that were part of the interviews is that the leadership support is indeed the key, and it's a basis for, for getting this, uh, in, in this um, uh, in, initiatives uh, developed. Uh, what was interesting also is that the majority of our good practices came from the bottom up, which meant that it was a member of the staff or more members of the staff that uh, decided that needed to be done so that uh, more training needed to be implemented um, uh, in, the, in the university or in the doctoral school. But they succeeded in getting their idea approved and further developed only because of course the leaders of, the, of their institutions appro uh, uh, approved them, but also were able to listen. So this is something that we would uh, advise all uh, um, uh, leaders of the university to, to, to foster and. Uh, and uh, pay attention to. Another interesting um, finding is that uh, universities uh, can uh, indeed uh, leverage on the network of contacts that uh, surrounds them to find the capacity they need to uh, implement and also to, uh, to support the good practice. Uh, to, to explain this better, we had a, um, a case study from U Bremen uh, Research Alliance from Germany, and which is a network of uh, the University of Bremen and different research institutions. And they, uh, by um, constant communication with all the networks and with all the um, stakeholders, both academic and private, were able to find uh, all the lecturers for the program they uh, implemented, which, uh, which uh, decided to uh, join this program on a voluntary basis. So universities uh, which are not uh, working in, uh, in isolation should really pay attention to, to, the, to the ecosystem they, they uh, operate on. 
The third pillar is the implementation pillar. And here we were looking for uh, the practical steps that uh, took, um, uh, that these universities took to implement their good practices, but also to the challenges that, uh, um, that, that could happen and uh, how they would uh, overcome them. Again, we saw that uh, leadership support is, uh, is again key, uh, mostly because of course, uh, to uh, ensure that uh, a good practice gets uh, implemented smoothly, uh, you need uh, the, the support of, uh, of the management of the universities, but also it's very much important to foster communication across different levels and different actors. This is something very important because each and every one of the good practice we um, we talk to, they uh, they mention this. So we really saw that uh, uh, ensuring that all stakeholders the need to take decision in terms of uh, uh, bringing forward the work of the of the initiatives needs to be uh, always engaged in the in the talks and uh, be sure that they all agree on uh, on the best way to proceed and to um, uh, to address any challenges that might arise. The last pillar is the impact pillar, and here it's what we were really looking after uh, was sustainability. So how these universities were able to ensure that the impact of the practice would not just be for the short term, but rather um, uh, remain uh, within the, the within the participants of the of the different initiatives. Here, something that was clear, and um, this came from the, especially from the um, interview we had with the, with the University of Minho regarding the, their, their good practice, is that policies, infrastructures, and the training are linked with each other and should develop together. Uh, this means that, for example, a university can have uh, um, a lot of training activities to teach FAIR and RDM, and also the right infrastructure to then practice, uh, to then practice open science. But uh, if there is no uh, open science policy at the institutional level, or if there is not a framework that, that can regulate it, uh, all the impact, all the positive uh, benefits of having uh, uh, these other two elements uh, get lost in the time. At the same time, a university can have the right policies and the right infrastructure, but without training activities, there is no way that uh, they can uh, they can better and uh, um, they can be put to a better use. Another strategic finding, I would say, that uh, we uh, we saw from talking with the good practices is that uh, it might be very uh, interesting to find synergies with other priorities in the institutional and national agenda. Um, this, uh, for example, um, research ethics and integrity might be uh, uh, one of these. Uh, we got the, um, uh, the example of Tampere University that uh, decided to put some basic notions of RDM and fair data, um, fair data in their course for research ethics and integrity, which is a mandatory course for all the doctoral candidates. And this was indeed very useful in ensuring that at least all uh, doctoral candidates would have a basic knowledge on, of, what this, uh, of what RDM and fair data mean so that they could start at least applying or uh, thinking about uh, getting more, more, more training on this. But also we should not uh, forget that uh, um, RDM and fair data is not just a matter of uh, uh, open science, but also um, can be put into the broader framework and broader discussion around digitalization. And this was something that was again, very clear from the good practice uh, of, uh, uni of the University of Minho, where the, the MOOC, the um, online MOOC on uh, research data management that they uh, developed was actually funded through a national program that aimed at promoting digital skills. So it's really important for university to find this possibility for synergies with, uh, with, other, uh, with other priorities. The last finding uh, that I would like to mention, which is also a little bit related to the, the, the finding I opened with, it's about having a clear strategy and aims. Uh, this is, uh, uh, as I was mentioning before, indeed very useful, not only for defining the good practice when you start, but also for ensuring that the, uh, the training initiative will, uh, will have an impact in the long term and that any challenges that might arise will be met with, uh, with the right tools. 
And uh, I'm mentioning this also because we got a very interesting um, finding from one of the practices, again, from uh, the UBREM Research Alliance, uh, which were, uh, was able to a little bit uh, uh, address the challenge imposed by the COVID-19 crisis and uh, uh, transform, and we can say, to opportunities. In fact, they saw that by switching all the, the training activities online, it was possible to reach a wider pool of participants which were not in the original uh, target group. And uh, this was so um, effective and made the, um, made the good practice so, um, so successful that they decided to maintain a little bit of this uh, uh, hybrid models and uh, online learning uh, um, feature also when COVID will, will, will be finished. So these are the very uh, first and preliminary findings that we, we have gathered until now. Uh, as I mentioned, we are now working to, uh, to talk with more good practices and uh, we will, um, uh, of course, present and uh, enrich this, uh, these uh, findings with uh, new points of view. Uh, please, uh, I will be happy to reply to any of your questions during the uh, Q&A and the discussion during the breakout rooms. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Federica, for your presentation. Um, I, I, I really like that last point you made in the preliminary findings where you already see the sort of the, the impact of COVID-19 where people are trying to sort of not only see the challenge, but also like how does this affect us as an opportunity to, to develop these courses? So you see that all of this is happening not in isolation, but it is being developed in sort of just the context of what we're going through in society right now. Um, I'm going to give the word to our next presenter. Very happy to welcome Elizabeth Newbold uh, from the Science and Technology Facilities Council in the UK, who will be talking about uh, another thing the Fair Sphere project has been doing, which is the Data Steward Instructor Training Series. Uh, Elizabeth is going to talk about uh, their approach to this uh, training series, but also some observations, lessons learned uh, throughout that experience. Elizabeth, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Brecht. Um, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. As I said, um, I lead another work package in the Fairs Fair project, and uh, we have a range of activities, and our, one of our objectives is to support a range of communities in their activities aimed at fair data uptake and compliance and deliver data stewardship training. And it's the delivery of the training, which is I want to talk a bit about today. Um, it complements the work that Federica has already talked about, but we're actually providing practical training um, within this work package. So I think it's probably also very worthwhile for me to briefly say what we see as a data steward, given I talk about data steward instructor training. Um, and it's a phrase that can have multiple meanings and interpretations depending on the context or environment in which somebody works. But when we're talking about data stewards, we're really talking about um, the instructor training we're delivering are for professionals in a support role. They have very many related job titles and there are probably relatively few professionals who are actually called data stewards. And the roles that they can carry out cover a wide spectrum of activities. Some are more related to data scientists and others are more like information professionals or data librarians. So there's probably three flavors of data stewards. Um, those that are embedded and operational. And an example of this might be somebody working in a research group on a specific discipline and on a project providing day-to-day -day work as part of a project team. Um, roles which are more generic and advisory, they can be domain agnostic, they're providing more advice and training, for example, working in repository services or a library setting. Um, and then the third type are more those related to policy strategy coordination. So maybe working on data policy development, maybe working on the overall institutional strategy. And they could be part of a university or research institution. They might be a library or research administration department. It's also worth noting, I think, that these roles are not necessarily distinct and the differences will vary on where somebody work and somebody might actually have a little bit of everything in what they do. But generally, when we've been talking about our instructor training, we are taking a broad view of the training activities and on the whole have been developed to support those more generic and advisory roles, those who are providing training and support themselves. But um, it's obviously applicable to other people who want to take on that role of instruction. So what have we been doing? Um, we had a plan. Uh, this is a three year project. It started in 2019. Um, we have a whole series of events we were going to do. 
Um, and our original plan was that we were going to run the data stewardship training alongside the CoData RDA data science summer schools. There's going to be a separate strand of data stewards, uh, instructors who would work alongside early career researchers in the first week on a common curriculum and they would split out um, and do some specific data stewardship type training. The idea was working together, the data stewards and the ECRs would learn together and they would understand each other's roles. And there was a pilot program for data stewards in 2019. These schools typically take place in two weeks in Trieste in August um, in this um, in lovely um, residential program. So 2019 went ahead as planned. Um, after the 2019 activity, there was some initial assessment, thinking about how to change things. And the plan was to run everything for 2020 in exactly the same way, um, with different tweaks. But then um, COVID happened um, and we couldn't do in-person events. So we have to have a complete rethink and redesign of the delivery. Um, this wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, there have been some advantages from it um, and it's given us a chance to reflect. So we had a change of format. So it's not just online, but also the length and structure. Uh, one of the conclusions was actually that it's very difficult for people who are in a support role to actually take two weeks off to go and attend a training, even if that is an online event. So we've concentrated on dedicated instructor trainings. We tried some pilot events uh, we, with an institution in uh, November, and we also worked um, with an uh, organization in Costa Rica in December as well. So we've had an international flavor to this. And during this time, um, as we were redeveloping and redesigning the delivery, we've had discussions with different regional groups. So where we are now is, uh, we have a common model of train the trainer activities aimed at instructors who will be delivering the training within their own institutions. So I said it's aimed at the data stewards who are in generic roles and mainly in universities, although there are other research performing institutions who have taken part in these activities. There's a list of topics that can be chosen from and swapped around to better suit the local environment and needs. And we tend to do this over three half days. Um, we've taken a, a sort of flipped learning approach, so the materials are shared in advance, and then there's also homework to be completed in between times, and we have a discussion space set up on the Fair Data Forum. We've worked locally with a regional partner, um, so they haven't just been based at one university. The uh, local partner has worked with us to sort of bring people together from different institutions from their country, and we've delivered three events uh, with Ireland, Belgium and Poland. The other advantage is we've been working in partnership with other EOS related projects, particularly EOS Synergy, to bring in skills that they have to supplement the programme. And this is one of where the advantages that we found about transitioning to an online um, programme. We've been able to get a wider range of people involved. We've been able to have a greater reach and we've been able to have more people actually attending the sessions. So we tend to have around 30 attendees for multiple institutions. And there is a very strong emphasis on teamwork where we're encouraging members to get to know each other and to build some communities. Um, this, is, this is actually, as I said, has been one of the real advantages of moving to the online. Um, it's not something which would have been so easy to do if we tried to get people together in person. The advantages as well about doing it in a regional thing is that afterwards people can build those networks themselves and can meet and discuss ideas on, um, in an ongoing way. So this is just, uh, just to say as an example, we have a learning aim and a learning outcome for the course. Um, it, it gets tailored for each individual event. And as I said, we, we pick the topics that are of most interest to in those areas. There's relatively few topics and there's uh, very short sessions. Um, we have about 10 hours of synchronous uh, working in discussion and then an additional asynchronous working on the homework afterwards. So that's what we've been doing. Um, and some of the observations that we have found as a result of this uh, training examples. I would also say these are observations. It's not been quantitative analysis, but it gives a flavor of what's happening and some perceptions um, regardless of the country. So we said, we've done these regionally. We did the first one in Trieste, which was a mixture of people. And then we did these three um, island, Belgium and Poland ones. 
As part of the First Fair project as well, we've also done some roadshows in different countries. And as that, we've actually asked some questions about whether they're employing data stewards or similar support roles. So one of our observations is that universities are employing data stewards or related roles, but often they're not called data stewards. Um, they have very variable job titles, so they might not be identified as a data steward in their organisation. So these are often people self-identifying with this activity. There is obviously uh, a gap. Um, there's very, relatively few roles, but there are a lot of people who are hoping to have these roles. So this is where we hope that the work that Federico mentioned earlier and the training that we've been doing can help to sort of um, up, upskill these people who are going to be coming into these roles. One of the other things that given that people aren't necessarily called data stewards, and we also mentioned earlier that people have variable type job titles, but also different types of uh, data stewardship roles, is really that a set of skills and competences is needed. It's not about training for a specific role because there is not necessarily a specific role that you can train to. So it is really on concentrating on the skills that people need to be able to actively engage in their university setting or institution. One of the things that we found um, when, we, when we've been working with the regional events uh, is that people are often working in small teams or singleton posts, as you can see from the data. Uh, we asked them if they're part of a data steward team and there's an awful lot who are just me by themselves or in very small teams. The other thing that we're discovering is that people are often new to the role and a lot of people have been in the role less than six months. Um, obviously this could just be that the people who are interested in the training are those who are new to the role, but um, it does seem to be a bit of a trend. And because of this, there is a definite need for training, um, not just the training and the skills, but the community building and support for the emerging roles because people can actually be quite isolated in their institution. They're be, being seen as the expert on these topics, but they are often quite unsupported in their own development. And therefore there's this desire to bring people together from a different organisations to share experience and, and knowledge, um, which is, is pretty much critical for capacity building in the future, we feel. So many people are doing data, uh, doing data stewardship, but not necessarily identified as data stewards. There's a very much a clear demand for practical advice. One of the things that we particularly get asked for is around data management planning um, activities when we're doing the instructor training. People taking on these roles are having to do a significant amount of training and communication. So that's another key skill set apart from the technical skills. They also need to have these good training and communication skills. There is interest in more advanced topics such as ontologies, but it requires a much bigger training um, uh, input than is available at the moment. And different regions have different levels of contact within the community. Some are just starting out and some are very well established. So our three key lessons probably are, there needs to be a focus on community building. People need to know that they are others in the same situation. There are people more advanced they can learn from and there'll be people coming behind them as well who they can help. There is a focus on everything that data stewardship can do, but it's probably more important to do the basics and then come back to the advanced topics later on. And in the rush to communicate, we also need to step back and think about the design. So we've had a, a sort of whole session on the pedagogy that needed to do the data steward instruction. And uh, just finally, as I said, we've done some regional events and this is a shameless plug. We have two more uh, data stewardship instructor workshops coming up, one in November and one in December. Um, and in this case, we're not going to work with a regional partner. We're just running these as completely open events that people can apply for. And the deadline for applications is the 15th of October. So if anybody is interested, do please apply for the training. And it'd be great to hear your views and, and learn the experiences from that. So just finally, thank you. Thank you to everybody who's attended our training and that we've learned from. And thank you to all my colleagues and first fair who's been doing the delivery. Thank you, Brecht. Thank you, Elizabeth. This is... Um... I mean, this is clearly very impressive work, which you've been involved with. So thank you for sharing uh, your observations, also just the approach that you've taken throughout this work. Um, we're, we're moving on uh, to the next presentation almost immediately, just to stay on schedule. Uh, we're welcoming Angus White uh, from the Digital Creation Center at the University of Edinburgh. 
who is going to talk about uh, yet another part of the Ferris Fair project uh, work that's been carried out uh, in terms of assessing the capabilities for data stewardship uh, provisions. So Angus, welcome, and the floor is all yours. Afternoon, Brecht, thank you. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, we can see your slides. So if you could go full screen. Can you see that now? Yes, and you should swap the displays, I think. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm Angus White. I, I, uh, I work in Fierce Fair with Joy Davidson in Work Package 3, which is one of, one of the other uh, work packages in the project. And um, I'd like to thank uh, colleagues who've been working with me on, on, on this, especially um, Laura Malloy from Codata and, and also Brecht who fit into uh, an earlier draft of uh, the material that I'll share um, with you shortly. Um, I'd, I'd like to give you a, a, a brief introduction to uh, uh, this framework that we're calling ACME, um, which is intended for organisations to self-assess their cap capabilities to enable fair data. Uh, there are seven topics in, in it, um, one of which is particularly relevant for, the, for, for this afternoon, uh, which is professionalising roles uh, through training, mentoring and recognition. Um, so uh, just uh, putting this in the, in the context of the project as a whole, um, we're trying to offer practical solutions for the use of fair data principles, um, with an emphasis on, uh, the, on the culture change aspect of, of, of this and on promoting the uptake of uh, good practices. And in, in the task that I'm involved in in particular, we're looking to identify areas of practice where changes would have greatest effect in furthering fair principles. We're really taking our steer from turning fear into reality, which was the report a few years ago, uh, which a lot of you will be familiar with from the high level expert group on on uh, fear for the commission. Um, we're focusing on on the enabling role of, of RDM services and uh, those in research producing organizations in, in particular. Um, and uh, just uh, stepping back to consider uh, where we're coming from and how we're defining these these terms, we're defining RDM services in a, in a, a very, uh, I hope, straightforward way as means of uh, delivering value to producers and users of digital research objects by f facilitating the outcomes they want to achieve without the ownership of specific costs or risks. So capabilities in that sense are just the ability to generate uh, those kinds of things. Um, so the capability uh, model uh, defines what the service needs to be able to do to successfully achieve those kinds of outcomes and offer value to uh, service users. And where I, I hope um, in line with what the OECD has been recommending in its recent report, um, uh, build, building digital workforce capacity and skills for data intensive science, uh, where they talk about maturity models uh, being a, a, a useful approach for organizations to assess their effectiveness in a given area and uh, and to do that, um, guided by strategic leadership. Um, 
I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because I know we're a bit behind schedule, but um, this ACME approach is one of a number of self-assessment frameworks in Fearsphere, uh, in including self-assessment of repositories and um, of uh, uh, their content uh, through a tool called Fuji. Um, where has this approach come from? So uh, we've got experience of this, doing this kind of thing in uh, DCC through a framework we developed in the UK context called RISE. Um, we're also drawing on, on work in the Netherlands uh, on, a, on a framework called Do I Pass for Fear? And um, underpinning it with turning fear into reality and, and also our recommendations in Fear is Fear on policy and practice. Uh, I should have had links to those reports, but uh, they're in, in our Sonodo community. Um, the other input is from uh, a Science Europe guide, uh, and uh, I, I should um, um, say I'm, I'm, I'm not representing Science Europe, but they have their own guide on um, sustainable research data, which is a, a set of uh, capability matrices they brought out earlier in the year. Um, and uh, when we became aware of this, we um, got in touch with them and we agreed that um, our, our approach was kind of complementary and that uh, what uh, we're, we're doing can um, um, feed into that strategic level view that, that Science Europe give in their matrices to, to try and uh, promote dialogue within the organisation on um, how to build capabilities. Um, and it, it can also uh, uh, work to other use cases across inst inst institutions. Uh, so maybe uh, national level competence centres uh, looking to um, work across in institutions and, and gather uh, uh, their own their collective assessments on uh, where they stand. Um, so uh, just a, a, a kind of overview of the science Europe matrices. So they have uh, focused on 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 six areas ranging from organizational engagement and commitment through the policy environment, financial aspects, training, technical preparedness, and communication and awareness raising. Um, we're trying to um, work with broadly similar levels and, and expand on um, uh, what they call te technical preparedness, uh, I think in the broader sense of word technical. Uh, we've looked at uh, the, uh, the first and last of the science year periods in conjunction with each other and um, uh, come up with uh, seven themes. So uh, defining the, the policy environment, developing sustainable business models, um, <coughs> excuse me, the um, uh, focus for today on the professionalization of the roles through training and mentoring and uh, recognition of those uh, roles. Um, uh, <coughs> through to uh, support for data management planning, for defining interoperability frameworks, uh, helping people choose data to make fair and services to support that, uh, ensuring the uh, uh, curation of, of the outcomes, outputs uh, in trusted environments, and um, engaging with uh, the relevant communities. <clears throat> uh, we've, uh, we've used similar kinds of uh, three level scales, but in this framework, we're trying to separate out uh, 
uh, maturity, which uh, uh, we um, use in a way that's uh, uh, hopefully consistent with capability maturity models elsewhere. So uh, using that to refer to alignment with um, organizational standards uh, and um, separating out community engagement, awareness, adoption and collaboration. Um, the reason for doing that is really because we realize that uh, when we're trying to support researchers, they have their own communities and their own standards, and they often want to uh, uh, rightfully um, fit with those and, um, you know, uh, they're not always interested in in uh, uh, standards uh, for the ins 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 institution in the way that uh, we, we might want, but we want to um, you know, make those fit together. And um, where there's um, uh, differences in in the services uh, uh, level of uh, practice, then that can be ins ins instructive for uh, um, uh, planning further initiatives. Uh, so um, we've been working on, on this on those seven different themes. We, we've got a draft of of the one on on uh, professionalizing roles. Uh, there's uh, uh, a link in, in the slides, which uh, unfortunately I can't put into the chat because uh, my screen is um, uh, not showing the chat, but uh, we'll, we'll put that in there. Um, uh, very keen to get feedback on, on that. Uh, it's broken down into a further six areas. So uh, uh, Defining the professional roles and, and profiles, uh, the training of professional services staff and, and, and for researchers, um, developing the fair enabling educational curricula for s students, uh, which is uh, the, the area that Work Package 7 is, in Fair Sphere has been focusing on, um, recognizing the skills acquisition through certification and accreditation and other aspects of human resource human resources. Uh, so these are areas broadly that uh, you can see the um, you know, aligning them with the approach of the organization as a whole really matters. And the other two aspects are, are areas where aligning with the uh, the research communities is is uh, probably the more important thing, uh, and that's advocating and raising awareness of fair data policy and principles, and engaging in mentorship uh, with the professional support networks. Um, hopefully, those uh, six areas are, are are things that align with. Um, what you're planning in your in 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 your organization, um, I, I guess uh, there are uh, uh, maybe different things, and that's what we hope to learn in in in, or I hope to get out of the breakouts is uh, to try and see if if these are are the things that you're prioritizing. Um, really love to hear your feedback, and uh, um, we'll be releasing. Uh, a draft in November uh, that's a bit more mature than than, than the one uh, that's in the Google Doc, uh, but um, as a, as a, as I say, your your comments and questions are very welcome, and, and thanks for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Angus. Uh, again, very impressive. I, I think sort of seeing all these presentations one after the other is just, it really speaks to the richness of, of all the material that's being developed in the project. And as I, I started my welcome by saying, 
we are now in, in sort of the final stretch of this project. And I think it really shows from also your presentation angle that we're getting to uh, a point where this material is, is ready to, uh, to really make a meaningful impact uh, within the community. So thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm not seeing uh, any immediate uh, questions, uh, which is, is not bad for us because we're a little bit uh, slow on time. So what I suggest is since all the speakers uh, will show up in the breakout sessions and we want to focus on the discussion there is we, we do not go into Q&A right now. Uh, I will let my colleague Federica introduce uh, just quickly the technicalities of the breakout sessions. We'll be using neural boards uh, to organize the discussion. And then after she's just given us a quick view of the technicalities for people not familiar with neural, then uh, we will automatically be pushed into breakout sessions until uh, 10 to 6, at which point we'll come back here for a quick wrap-up session, uh, just highlighting the main ideas uh, from the breakout discussions. Perfect. Um, share my... Okay, so for um, those of you that are not familiar with uh, Mural, the, uh, the aim of this exercise will be to gather your feedback around this question that the moderators will uh, introduce. I will just say how you can give us your feedback. The main uh, objectives of Mural is to post some uh, sticky notes uh, on the, in the different section that you see here. You can move in the document by using your mouse and uh, zoom in and zoom out uh, using this uh, um, board at the bottom right side of your screen and also your mouse. To create the sticky notes, you can uh, either double click with, uh, with your mouse and then uh, start uh, writing into it or using, um, you can use this uh, um, menu on the, on the left by clicking on here text and then select the sticky notes you want to use or you can directly write a text another um, feature that you can use if you see that a person wrote something that you agree on or disagree is to use these icons to upvote and uh, uh, or downvote any comments you may see in the in the screen so i think i very quickly went over the basics uh, of a mural, but uh, you can ask uh, uh, our moderators if you have any question. There is also a very brief uh, um, explanation at the top of the boards. Uh, and uh, the moderators will uh, share with you the link to access this, uh, these boards as soon as we are divided into, into the breakout rooms. Okay, so I'll open the breakout rooms. <laughs> yes, thank you, Ilari. Okay, so unfortunately, Federica, they are not working as expected. So I will have to assign people. Okay, then if you can just do it uh, randomly so that yes, we get... Yes, uh, okay, so I wait, can for, also... wait for people to, okay. to come. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ilaria. I will uh, join my room also if you need anything. Okay, thanks. Thank you.
Hey, I thought that I was an, an additional minute <laughs> to finish. <laughs> well, I actually left you 30 seconds more. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> well, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I, I imagine people are joining us, uh, are coming back into the plenary session. Uh, I, I hope you had good breakout sessions. Uh, this is the wrap, out, uh, wrap up uh, phase. And uh, really, I think it's just for the moderators and note takers to very briefly reflect on a couple of things that were mentioned in the discussions. Uh, and I think then we've all deserved uh, an evening off after that. Um, I think just if I can just sort of go first, we, we had a, a 20 minute, uh, 25 minute breakout session. Uh, we didn't go into too much detail. Uh, but again, thank you for everyone in our breakout session. I think we, we really saw that a couple of initiatives, a couple of elements were raised that are important in the discussion and that sort of show us that the Fair is Fair project is sort of identifying the right elements because we saw a couple of things come up, such as um, there was a colleague from Coimbra who, uh, who mentioned, well, you know, we, we've just started an initiative where me and a colleague, we found each other uh, we found out we were working on this and we went to our leadership saying, okay, we want to offer a course on this. It's, 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 a, it's a small start, but it's a very important start just within one institution to find each other and, and take an initiative. So that I think that was really nice to hear. Uh, there was also some discussion about EU requirements within Europe, uh, the European Union. Now it's Horizon Europe and the model grant agreement. There is uh, an idea it's okay if it's eu funded if it's publicly funded we do want uh fair data we do want fair data that the data that comes out of this is fair um so that was raised and that led to a discussion about well are institutions ready for this you know are institutions aware and ready for this are researchers aware of this because maybe institutions are um consciously or unconsciously already adhering to the fair data principles but are the researchers doing this and are institutions ready to support their researchers on that path. Uh, but it was also a little bit of discussion about, okay, uh, FAIR is essentially just quality control for data, uh, to be very blunt about it. And FAIR is not necessarily open and open is not necessarily quality. So there is a relation to the open science transition, but it's not exactly the same either. Just to be clear about that, uh, the colleague from Stellenbosch University in South Africa uh, mentioned that and and that's where I want to conclude for our session is that uh, you know we had a colleague from Stellenbosch in South Africa coming in which really shows that this is also something that goes beyond Europe this is not just our little corner of the world this is something that is being discussed uh, across the globe uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it to one of the other moderators to maybe come in give a quick recap of their session uh, Pedro yes let me try to do that uh exercise it's it's a challenge so uh, um, it was a, a good session not so 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 with some lots of comments from the audience but se some se several but also with lots of uh, at least post-its here in the in the mural so in terms of of uh, of, of scope what what is important to highlight is that that, that this need of um, of uh, that the alignment to and the compliance with uh, with funder requirements is always something that uh, that can drive uh, some of the of the the initiatives at the institutional level. So um, uh, this is the, the this compliance is really important to to put to, to put forward uh, initiatives at the institutional level. Um, uh, then uh, also it, in this in this scope and objective so there are uh, one interesting uh, one interesting um, discussion is about uh, the 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 local the the faculty initiatives uh, that they know their needs they are close to the, the to the end users to the researchers they know that they need to implement something regarding rdm and fair data but then uh, to scale, it's it's important to do it at the university level. Uh, so and it, and sometimes it's, this is difficult. Uh, so we can act at the faculty level or the department level, but it's difficult to promote and to organize it at the, at the, at a broader level, at the university level, and uh, and we need to find the the capacity to do it at the, at the, in terms of a, a coordination 
um, and to have a strategy at the university level. So acting as a faculty is sometimes easier than acting and have a policy or a strategy at the university level. So finding resources for that. And uh, so we have the capacity to act local, but not at the university level. Um, this is, was an interesting, I think, discussing this. Again. Then the implementation part, uh, we, I think the, all the effort is really on the, on the training program. So um, different kinds of, uh, types of trainings, uh, hands on sessions from experts. Uh, so the idea of, of putting forward a, a training program for staff and for researchers, this is critical. And this will contribute to, to, to avoid uh, one of the barriers that several participants identify, that is the commitment of researchers to these uh, practices, to change cultural, to, to put in practice some good practices in terms of RDM and fair data. Um, we didn't have time enough to discuss the things about the, the impact. Uh, more on the, on the side of implementation, but we have some comments uh, uh, that sometimes uh, having repositories, this will facilitate a lot uh, to push for, for good uh, RDM practices. Uh, having also a train the trainer approach and the support from leaders will also simplify and will provide more impact to the institutional initiatives. Yeah, thank you more or less the... this yes for, yeah thank you for this that. is what is possible to organize for now <laughs> it's it's a lot for for a relatively short breakout session yes, yes. And but i think we have very good comments in the in the mural i think we, mm -hmm. it will be interesting yeah. same for us and then looking at either joy or elizabeth who wants to come in yeah i'll just very briefly um we had a, a fairly small group so we had some some fairly similar discussions i think to what was coming up through your groups um, we saw Horizon Europe both as a driver, but also as an opportunity to support some of the uh, capacity building at the institutional level. Um, looking at some of the capacity challenges, I think the big thing that came out was, um, number one, that it can be very difficult to engage senior government uh, governance bodies at your institution in something that may seem quite niche to them. So uh, topics like research data management and fair data aren't always the things that senior management are, are talking about. Um, so one of the things we thought was that it, it really does, and I think this comes to, back to something Federica said in her talk, tie it into something that they do care about. Um, so whether that's research integrity or ethics or something that is on their agenda, make sure that you can tie research data management and FAIR into that. I think the other kind of key capacity issue that came up as a, a, a challenge is the mobilization of different actors across the institution. So as Elizabeth mentioned, there's so many different people involved in data stewardship. They're not all called data stewards. They, they have a number of different roles at the institutional level. And it can be hard to know who's actually doing something that should be drawn into this bigger framework and how you just get that bigger picture of who is involved and what they can offer. So um, I, I think one of the things that has to be done is, is more to kind of do an audit of what's available at your institution and who has to be involved in these in the discussions. Um, I, I think the point was raised though that it can be a very step-by-step -step process. So it's not gonna happen overnight. You, you have to start uh, realistically and get people involved and maybe expand and, and uh, grow bigger over time. Uh, but I think that that was largely the, the kind of key things we were talking about. And I see we're <laughs> kind of up to time, so I'll, I'll close it there and, and we can wrap up and, and I'll get it back to you then. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and just giving a quick recap of, of what I think is obviously like uh, a more detailed discussion. But just in, in, in short terms, I think thank you, uh, Pedro, as well, um, to come in at the end of this. So indeed, we're, we're out of time, essentially. Um, the only thing that's left for me is, I think, to thank everyone who presented, everyone who uh, participated, uh, put information into the mural, uh, came out during the breakout sessions to talk about their own experiences. Uh, thank you all so much. I think we've all deserved uh, an evening off. And last but not least, uh, the technical support from the organization. Thank you as well. And I will we'll leave it there. So have a good evening, everyone, and hope to see you at one of the next events. Thank you. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye bye.